Last time we saw the magic of grid views in that they allow us to do inserts, updates, and plump, let me read, whoa, two seconds into the lecture I already made a mistake. We saw the magic of grid views which allow us to do updates and deletes. They do not allow us to do inserts. That is the native default behavior does not allow us to do inserts. Um, if you look around, if you do some Googling, you can find people that have tweaked the grid view to make it do inserts, but that's not part of the default behavior. So, um, we saw the default behavior, and it did a lot for us, but it didn't do everything quite the way that we would like it to do it. Um, and I'll review that in a minute and review the functionality um, of it how it works, what we don't like about it. And then today we're going to address some of those um, shortcomings and, and try, to, try to work around them. Uh, if we have time, we'll start looking at uh, details views, which are very, 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 very similar to grid views in the way that you make them work to do inserts, updates, and deletes. They can actually do inserts, so I didn't misspeak there. It was very similar. So, let's open it. Am I the only one that thinks that like 40 degrees and rainy is colder than like zero degrees and a blizzard? I think a lot of times it, it feels it. Although apparently there's a Scandinavian saying that says something like, there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothing choices. So... Maybe if I wore a heavier jacket, I'd be okay today. All right. So let's go and open up our website. And we'll look at it. We did this on the division list. And if we're going to view the division list, we'll notice if we look at the code view, we have on the data source a bunch of stuff that wasn't there before. We have the connection string and the provider somewhere in there. But we also have a delete command, which specifies the command of how to delete something. And as you'd expect, <clears throat> the delete command is delete from table name where the primary key equals question mark. So we'll run that, uh, we'll, we'll supply the value for that parameter at runtime. Um, normally that's how we want deletes to work because normally within the context of a, an application like this, we're going to be dealing with like doing something to one row. All right. Uh, there's a possibility for mass deletions and mass updates, but generally speaking, if you're talking about the standard, like I'm going to insert a new division, I'm going to change a division, I'm going to delete a division, you're talking about just doing it to one row, which means that you use the primary key to point to so that you only get that one row. Because remember, if we omit <coughs> the question, uh, if we omit the where clause from uh, a delete statement, it will try to delete everything. And depending on how the cascade deletes are set, that might not be a good idea. In fact, it's never a good idea, but it might be tragic to delete that because you might cascade and delete a bunch of stuff from a bunch of tables. All right, so delete from division where division ID equals question mark. The insert command, which is not really relevant here, but we have the insert command with the values. The select command which we've seen before. And finally, the update command. We set the abbreviation full name where division ID equals question mark. The delete parameters then, <coughs> uh, insert parameters and update parameters correspond to the question marks and are correct by position. So notice that in the delete statement, there's one question mark. So there's place for one parameter. What do we put in there? We put in the division ID. All right, the division ID from, the division ID is used to delete a row from that data source. All right, uh, the update parameters, <coughs> the, 
Notice we have three, the abbreviation, the full name, and the division ID. And those correspond in order to the parameters here. Abbreviation, full name, division ID. So it's important to go and, and understand it from the code viewpoint. Again, uh, the GUI is a wonderful thing when it works, that is. But it's a wonderful thing. But sometimes stuff that happens in the GUI, um, some things get obscured, I guess I, I want to say. Uh, it's a GUI's job to sort of shield you from some of the details. And in doing that, it might make it hard to see where a problem is. Whereas if you look at the code, if you know what you're looking at, sometimes you can zero in precisely on what the issue is and, 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 and notice it. Now, remember that there's two, always the two sides to this database connectivity. We have the, the data source, which is where the data comes from where the data is going to, you know, and then we have the visual presentation of it. So we've had that since the first <coughs> example that we had. We have, uh, in this case, we have a SQL data source and we have a grid view. Now, to make the SQL data source work, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to make the SQL data source work, we have to supply the update and delete statement. If we do that, then we can do updates and deletes, provided we set the grid view up that way. And that's sort of an important thing. You said view the server explorer and when well, we have a green arrow for that? I think that'll freeze. That'll you freeze. To, you have to do a ah. right click on the data connections first and re-plug in your database. Okay. See, I didn't pay attention last time. why this, um, if there is some, you know, exactly what causes that not to show a connection. You know, I wonder if that's a setting that we have or, or what. Uh, at any rate, we go and view Server Explorer. Oh, I don't want to do, do that. Open the website first. Then, and I'd right mouse and say add connection. add connection. So I have to lie and tell it I'm creating a new database. Yeah, but it still connects to the same string. Right. Thankfully. It looks like we're plugged it might, in. It might zap you out in a couple of seconds, so you have to be quick. Okay. I should have had that guy and open. If, and if it. not, the refresh usually reflects Okay. Uh, boy, I feel so much pressure. This is almost like a little, this is like a mini game. All right. Um, Figure. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, the way I created the insert, update, and delete, by the way, is I went into division, uh, the division table, selected all of them. Then I clicked advance and said uh, create the insert, update, and delete statement. Um, I could also go in and create a spe uh, specify a custom SQL statement and then do 
uh, the insert update and delete manually that way. Now, one thing. This is a real simple table. This is like about the simplest example I could come up with, a couple, come up with right? Because it's a single table that has like three columns, and or four col three columns, and one of them we're not even able to change because it's the primary key. Now, what if you have a more complicated case, like in our example? We might have a section, and a section. Uh, Re, uh, has a relationship to a course table and it also has a relationship to a faculty table. All right. Do you create your select statement having joins? I'm going to say no. All right. And that might, that might be what you've done in the earlier uh, versions of this. But when you get to maintaining tables, that is insert, update, and deleting, things work a lot smoother if you're only dealing with one table. Because remember, you can only delete a sing uh, insert, update, and delete from a single table at a time. So what I do is I would make my select be from the section table. Now you might say, well, that's going to show the course ID and faculty ID. I don't want to see the course ID and faculty ID. I want to see the course name and faculty name. We'll see how you can do that later on. All right? We'll do that through what's called a template column where we can still use the faculty ID from the section table, all right, but we can make it display as a drop-down that will show the faculty name. So, generally speaking, if you're doing a grid view or a details view that's going to be updating a table, then I would just do one table, all right, and then use the template columns to make the visual aspect of it look the way that you want it to. Because remember, there's a difference between the source of data and the way you're displaying it, the way it's going to look. All right? Now, we went in, we created that. The other thing that we have to do is we have to tell the grid view that it's okay to do editing and deleting. All right? You don't get these options if there's no insert. Uh, I keep saying insert, even though if I say insert, ignore it. Updates and deletes. There has to be an update and delete statement in the SQL data source for you to get these options in the grid view. But if there is an update and delete statement, that doesn't mean that updates and deletes are enabled until you make them enabled in the grid view. Uh, that may seem like a little bit extra work, but it gives you a lot more flexibility then. Because, as I said before, we could make it so that only certain people are allowed to edit and delete from the, uh, from the uh, division list. In fact, we'll do that later on today. I'll make it so that you have to be logged on to be able to uh, edit, from, edit the division list. All right? Okay. So now we run this. Here's our division list. Maybe. All right. If I go and edit this.
that are not in the default behavior. Should these things be in the default behavior? Oh, I don't know. When you start making something, when you're trying to make a, a component that handles every situation, sometimes that component becomes very, very complex. So this handles just the very basic operations, and you can customize it the way that you want it to. All right. One thing that we're going to do uh, is I'm going to now start using the notion of what's called a template column. All right. A template column is this. A template column is a column where we want to deviate from the standard default behavior. All right. So let's think of the places that we want to deviate from the standard behavior. Number one, we want there to be validation on abbreviation and full name. Because the default behavior gives us a text box, but doesn't put validation on it. All right? We could go and save it without having, um, without having um, data in it. The other thing I think we want to do is if we go and delete something, we want to confirm deletion and say, are you sure you want to delete that? Last but not least, when we're done deleting, if there was an error, we want to display a user-friendly error instead of uh, a big old ugly error. In fact, same thing with an update. If we have the database locked, let's do this. Let's say I go in to update this, and in the meantime, someone goes into the division table into design view, and that has that table exclusively opened. If I try to update it, we have a big old ugly air. All right. So we can't change that. So three things that we want to change is, number one, we want to add validation to these columns. Number two, we want to confirm deletion. And number three, whether it be an update or a delete, if a big old ugly error appears, we want to display a nice, concise, understandable error. Okay? So, let's, let's get to it. <coughs> First, thing <I'm coughs> excuse me. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to handle the validation issue. So I'm going to make sure that there's a value for abbreviation and full name. I do this by going into let me tell you what I can't do first off all right I can't do this I can't simply go and add a validation to the screen because that text box that appears when you're in edit mode isn't always there, right? It's not there when you're displaying it in read-only mode. It's only there when you're in edit mode. So I can't simply put a required validator on the page and say, go ahead and validate this. It doesn't work, okay? So I can't do that. So what I have to do is I have to go and edit my columns and for each of these I'm going to click and say convert this field into a template field. So I'm going to do that for abbreviation first. All right. Then we'll go back and do the same thing for the full name. So I click that on abbreviation. Now I have an option to edit templates and this will show me all my template columns. There is a, for abbreviation, there's an item template. 
The item template is what gets displayed when the grid is in read-only mode. All right? So that's the basic way of displaying this. Now, in this case, we're displaying it in a label. And that's fine. All right? Because it's just some text. So, of course, we're going to display it in a label. Alternating item allows us to make it displayed a little bit differently if we're alternating the items. You know, so you have the first item, second item, the third item, the fourth item. We can make each, uh, every other item have a slightly different display. All right. That sometimes for, especially for big data grids, um, that makes it more readable. But we're not even doing anything with that here. We have an edit item template. All right. And that's the one that I want because that's the that's what we see in the grid view when we're in edit mode. Notice we don't see a label here. We see a text box. So I converted it to a template and I looked through the templates and I found the edit item template. Now I can go and put a required field validator right inside that template. And I can edit data bindings, which means, no, I don't want to do that. I'm sorry. I can go in and I can manipulate that required field validator just like I would do for any required field validator. So I'll make my error message say must enter abbreviation for control to validate I pick text box one which is that text box right here the difference is, is before I couldn't do that because that text box doesn't appear all the time here, I'm editing the way the grid view looks like in edit mode. And in edit mode, that text box is always there. Okay? So I can go in and I can um, associate this required field validator with that text box. Now I'm good to go. And now if I go in and try to get rid of this and click update, I get a nice user-friendly message. It doesn't try the update and then blow up on me with a big, ugly message. Remember, as far as database, potential database problems go, there's, there's two ways of dealing with that. Number one is to put validation in there so the problem never happens. And, you know, that's a great solution if you can do it, right? Because in this case, I'm not going to get that error ever because my validation will make sure that, the, uh, that there's a value for that. So it will, it will, it will not allow it to get through without, without having that value. So when you can prevent a database error, that's great. And you can prevent a database error a couple different ways. And one of them is with validation. The other is by choosing the particular form control that you use. If there's a drop down, I can make sure that it always has a valid value and so on. So validator is a good way to prohibit that error from ever happening. And I hate to say prohibit because there's potential issues, but it minimizes the chance for that kind of error. Let's put it that way. All right, so all well and good. So I did it for that field. So now I don't have the risk of that blowing up, but I do have the same issue with the full name. So let's see how well you remember. What's the first thing I have to do to put that, to put the same sort of validation on the full name? What's the first thing I have to do? Pardon me? Convert to a template field. That's the first thing I have to do. So I'll go and I'll exit 
template editing, I'll go into edit columns, I'll find full name, and I'll say convert this to a template field. So boom, I do that. Okay. Now, I go into what? Edit templates. And if I click the little drop down, I have two template fields so I can see which item do I want to edit and which template for that item. So this is a column for abbreviation. So if you remember, I didn't edit the item template. I didn't edit the alternating item template, but I did edit the end edit item. I put the validation on. I want to do the same thing for the full name. I want to edit the edit item template. Then I simply go and drag over required validator. I get this is identical to validations that we discussed before. I could put more than one validator. Um, if this was a uh, something like a phone number, I could put a required field validator and a regular expression validator. If this was a range that the number had to be from 1 to 50 or something like that, I could put in a range validator. So I can use whatever validations I want to. In this case, the only validation I need is to validate that there's some value in there. So a required field validator is all that I need. So I put my required field validator. The control to validate is going to be text box 2. All right, which again is the second text box in this mode. And I'll give the error message to say must enter full name. We can do all the things we did before. We can change the class of it so that it has, uh, so it looks different and, and so on. All right, so now if we go and run this again, We go and edit this. We try to update it. We get both those errors. And we don't get the ugly error. All right. So we got a W on that one. We got a win. All right. Questions about that? When you hear that we want this to be changed, when we want our grid view to have a behavior different than the default, and we've seen the default, and we've seen the associated problems with the default, and we're always going to have those problems, all right? So, when there's something in the default behavior that you don't like, chances are the solution with a grid view is going to involve converting the column that you don't like into a template column. Because then you can go in and you can do special things to that column. The default behavior it just happens automatically. All right. When you make it a template column, that gives you a little bit of control over what happens. So the second one is, the second problem that we're going to address <coughs> is we're going to put a confirmation to delete because what we didn't like what I didn't like about that is that if you went in and said that you wanted to delete something it just went and deleted it so we want to ask the user to confirm that's pretty standard in most applications that you have uh, the uh, you have a confirmation if you try to do something uh, that, that's going to delete so how do we do that well Carrying through what I just said, we're going to make it, we're going to make something <laughs> into a template column. Now, what are we going to make into a template column? Well, edit columns. Actually going to make that very first field, the command field. That's the field that has all the links for update, delete, cancel, etc. But make that into a template column. So I did that. Did 
Did I not click that? Click convert it to a template field. I must not have. If I go into edit templates now, I look, I have column zero, which is edit, delete, and so on. Now I have three template columns. I click this link. I can get at the properties of that link. Here's where I can put in, on client click is where I can put in a snippet of JavaScript. And I'm going to type it in, we're going to test it, then I'm going to explain it. Return confirm do you really want to delete this division. Let me go and copy that so that we can see the whole thing. works and then I'll explain it to you why it worked. If it doesn't work, I'll explain it to you why it didn't work. So now if I hit delete, I get a confirmation box that says, do you really want to delete this division? If I hit cancel, the deletion stops. If I hit delete and say OK, then it's going to try to delete it. Of course, in this case, it's not going to be able to delete it, but the client side code doesn't know that. That requires a database operation to figure out if it's deletable or not. Alright, so if I click delete, boom, I get ugly error message. But we at least handled the confirm part of it. Whereas we're prompted, so if we accidentally hit delete, we have a, we have a second chance to look at it and, and decide what we want to do. So let's look at this JavaScript statement. Return, confirm, let's start from this part and go out. Confirm in JavaScript opens up that confirm dialog. It's like an alert. Many of you have probably used an alert in JavaScript where you just pop up an error message or some kind of message and there's an OK button. Confirm opens up a dialog where there are two, two choices, OK and Cancel. Alright? So, on client click means when this link is clicked, client side code is going to run. And client side code is JavaScript. So this is a JavaScript statement. The confirm displays that message and gives an OK and a cancel. Return sort of passes the value back to the click event. If OK is, collect, uh, is returned <coughs> to the click event, essentially that's returning a true, that everything's OK, then the click event will continue and it'll try to execute the delete. If I click false or, or cancel, effectively that passes false to the click event. And if you return false to an event in JavaScript, that says, okay, we're canceling it. We're not going ahead and doing it. So, in a nutshell, we write client side, a little snippet of client side JavaScript that displays a confirmed dialog. If an OK is pressed, a true gets returned, and that says it's OK to go ahead and try to do what you want to do. If you click cancel, that says, OK, cancel the click event. Don't go ahead and execute what you're going to do when this link was clicked. So that is 
You could put that in just about any one of your grid views on the delete link. We could put it on the update link too, but normally we don't ask people, gee, do you want to update this? You know, normally, you know, since a delete is destructive and since a delete potentially has the ability to uh, mess up a bunch of stuff, then we're going uh, we're gonna to be a little more careful with delete than we are with updates. Question on this. Okay. Now, last but not least, remember this happens on the client side. So this is just asking the user, but there may be reasons why we can't delete. All right? Namely, in this case, there's stuff at other tables that relate to the division. Let's go back and look at the relationship between division and faculty. There's a foreign key relationship, which means that there has to be a division ID. If there's a value in the division ID, it has to be something that's valid. And it's a required field. <clears throat> you could have a foreign key and make it not a required field, right? Um, sometimes that's hard for people to get their head around. All that's saying is if there is a value, it has to be in that table, right? It is possible to have a faculty person without a division, uh, maybe, at least when they start off being employed. Uh, maybe a, a better case would be uh, a, a place where you hire someone and you're not sure what department you're going to assign them to first. But you know you want to hire them. You just don't know, well, let's, let's hire them now, get them in, put them through training, and we'll figure out where to assign them later. All right? You might have a situation like that. With faculty, it probably doesn't make sense. It's, it's not like they're going to hire me and decide whether to have me teach computers or English. Right? Um, I'm hired for a specific spot. But in other employment situations, you might hire someone and not know exactly where they're going to go. So division wouldn't have to be a required field. All right? But when you make it a foreign key, it means if there is a value, it has to match a valid division. OK? Now, if we look at the relationships, in addition to being a foreign key, we have specified that deletes do not cascade. Remember, deletes always go from the parent to the child, from the one to the many. So we can delete a faculty person. There is no impact on the division, right? If you think about it, if I hit the lottery and quit, that doesn't mean that the engineering division disappears. All right? The reverse, though, is where it's relevant. If we delete the division of engineering, business, and IT. What happens to the faculty members? Are they deleted? Or do we prohibit deletion if there are any related rows? And in this case, we're not cascading, so we're prohibiting the deletion. All right, we're restricting the deletion. So what that means is if I go and try to delete the division e EBIT, I can't do it because there's a couple people that belong to that division. So, if I go and run this, try to delete that, say, yeah, I'm sure, boom, we get an ugly error message. Now, this is one of those errors that we could try to prohibit. We could write some pretty slick code to go in when you pull up a division, look to see if they have any faculty members, and if they do, disable the delete link. We could do that. However, there's ways that, you, that, that that could break, right? If someone transferred someone right after you pulled them up on the screen, right after you pulled a division up on the screen, or something like that. Remember, some database errors we try to prohibit. That's exactly what we did with that validation control. 
we put code in to prohibit that from happening. Other database errors, we try to do the operation, and if it fails, be there to clean it up. All right? So, it could be when we try to delete that, it could be that because there's related faculty members in that division. It could be that someone has that division table exclusively open. exclusively open. There's a whole slew of other sorts of database errors. The database crashed. Someone deleted a table, so we can't delete from that table. Whatever. There's a whole slew of database errors that we can't really program for, that we can't really anticipate and write code to prevent. What we can do, however, is be there with our broom and clean it up after it happens. Display a nice user-friendly error message, all right, that explains what happened and explains maybe what causes there are and explains how you could fix that error, all right? The point is, is where do we put that in? If we look at this example... There is no C-sharp code for us to put code in to do any of that stuff, right? Because normally for this sort of thing, we're talking a try-catch, right? When we had this problem last week, we had code that did the insert. We had C-sharp code that did the insert. So we could put a try-catch in there. Now, no place to put a try-catch, all right? So how do we do that? Well, we do that because the .NET framework, we do that by the .NET framework giving us a hook, several hooks, several events where we can place our code to test what happened or what's about to happen. And if we look, I'm going to go to the source for this. I'm going to find the grid view. Here's a grid view. And I'm going to create an event on the server side that I want to write code for. Alright, I'm going to create a function that ties to an event on the grid view that I want to code for. And let's look at our choices, because I can't just make up a brand new event, right? The events that I have access to are events that someone already put in the, code, in the framework. And there's nothing there right now, but they're, they're put in there so that we can write code. I call those kinds of things like hooks, all right? There's no, no code in there now. But there's a place for us to put code if we want to. And we want to. All right? So, if I start typing on, I see a list of all the events that are there that might have some default code or might not have some default code. All right? But it's a place for us to put our own code if we need it. Now, the ones I am interested in are the on-row events. And notice there's two of them in particular, or actually four of them in particular, that could be relevant here. I hope you can see that. One of them is on-row deleted 
One of them is on row deleting. The other one is on row updated. The one after that is on row updating. All right. Notice the tense of the verb. Updating is sort of present tense. It's in the process of being updated. Updated means it already happened. Or it, at the very least, it tried to happen. So where do you think we're going to put our code to catch and find out if an error occurred? In the updated, or in this case, actually deleted. On the deleted event or on the deleting event? We want to find out if an error has occurred. Deleted or deleting? Try matching the tense of the verbs. Where the error has occurred, whether an error has occurred. Deleted or deleting? I'd go with the past tense. You'd go with the past tense, and that's absolutely correct. We're going to find out if, when we tried to delete this, did an error happen? If there was code we wanted to put in before we tried to delete it, we'd put it in the deleting event. So the deleting event is where we put code in that we want to have happen before the delete is attempted. The deleted is where we're going to put code that we want to execute after the delete has been attempted. It's a little misleading because it says on row deleted. Um, but again, they, they didn't want to make the method names or the event names too long. What that really means is after we tried to delete the row. Because we could try to delete the row and it could work or not work. So we don't know for sure that the row was deleted just because the row deleted event happens. We know that they tried to delete it. So I'm going to put on the on row deleted event equals, and I'm going to create a new event. And that's called grid, row, uh, grid view one underscore row deleted. And that will put the code in the CS file. <clears throat> we talked about this before. I forget in which example. But remember that these things have to match up. I can't just go in here and make a grid row deleted event. I mean, I could, but that doesn't mean it will get executed unless this on row deleted points to that method. All right? If I were to delete this method, I would have to delete the on row deleted. So this is the thing that sort of matches up the action on the ASPX file with the code in the CS file. So these two things have to be synced up. All right? You have a method in the CS file. You, that corresponds to an event in the ASPX file. Okay. So now, we're going to write our code to handle this. First thing we're going to do is I'm going to put an a, a error label on the page. And I'll call it label error. And I'll initialize it to an empty string. All right. So now I have a place to put my error message. What I have to do now is I have to determine if an error occurred and then display my error message. So how do I know if an error occurred? Take a look at this and see what you think we have available to help us determine whether an error occurred or not. I have to put some code somewhere. We have to figure out how to tell whether there's a problem or not. 
This helps us determine whether there's a problem or not. This is the report of what happened when we tried to delete. All right? This argument. Remember, this is in the framework. When we delete something from the grid view, this method automatically gets called. All right? It gets called provided that we have the on row deleted method tied to that. All right. And it gets passed automatically these arguments. One is the sender. And the sender, I believe, in this case would be the grid view. In other words, who this happened to. This grid view deleted event args are a list of things that happened when the delete occurred. Let's Google this. By the way, these questions on Stack Overflow, like, what is the difference between an ASPX and ASPX CS file? Like, you know that some kid taking the quiz for their intro to ASP.NET, and they just, like, didn't show up for class that day, so they, they did that. All right. Here's the official Microsoft documentation for this, this class. There's some examples, blah, 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 blah. Properties are cancel, keys, row index. Row index is the row that was trying to be deleted. Value are the values of that row. So if you ever need these. And so on. So this gives us information about what we were trying to delete. All right. So, let's see what else is available here. dot exception. All right. That looks promising. What do you think e dot exception means? We know what an exception is, right? We've seen that in previous weeks. What do you think e dot exception is? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, it tells you what kind of exception is thrown. It tells you what kind of exception is thrown. All right. Uh, for what? Like uh, it, it just specifies is it like a null exception? Is a uh, you know some whatever arg whatever uh, exception argument? It's okay. Under. All right. What this tells us, uh, yeah, you're right. All right, but I want to add on a little bit to it. This tells us first of all, was there an exception generated when we tried to delete it? Right. 
because there might not be an exception. If there's no exception, what does that mean? Yeah, everything went okay. The deletion happened. So if this is null, that means everything went okay. The deletion occurred just like we would hope it to. All right? Now the problem is, what happens if that's not null? If it's not null, that means that some error occurred. All right? Some error occurred. And therefore, we want to do something with that error. All right? So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to check to see if that exception object is not equal null. Because if it's equal to null, everything's okay. All right? <coughs> if it is equal to null, everything's okay. If it's not equal to null, there's a problem. So what I could do, I could do a number of different things, and we'll try a couple of different things here. One thing I could do is I could just make, just say my label air dot text equals problem. All right. We have to do one more thing. We have to tell the exception of that that we handled it. Remember, with exceptions, someone's got to handle an exception. All right? Either you can handle it or the code in the framework will handle it. So what we're doing here is we're looking to see if an exception occurred. If the exception did occur, we're displaying an error message that just says, simply says problem. And we're telling the event, oh yeah, by the way, we handle that exception. You, Mr. Framework, Mr. or Mrs. Framework, don't need to do anything because we took care of this problem. We dealt with this problem. You don't have to do anything. So let's run this. So now if I try to delete this, I don't get the big ugly error message. I just get my message saying that, hey, you can't delete this. All right? What happens if we don't put this in? We still get the ugly error. Because we had some code there, but we didn't inform the framework that we took care of it. So the framework still thinks that it needs to take care of it. So it's important for us to put in that, yeah, we took care of this. So the rest of the code in the framework knows, hey, we don't have to worry about this exception. Now, really, simply displaying problem isn't really particularly good error exception handling, right? That doesn't really tell the user anything. One thing that we could do is we could do something like this. We could sort of do like we did <coughs> when we wrote our own try catches and maybe display the exception uh, and use a two-string method to get a nice little concise text description of the error. Okay? So let's see what happens if we do that. Well, we get that, but that's a little bit better because it's not on an ugly screen by itself, but it really doesn't tell the user much of anything. However, it does tell me as a software developer what I need to know. All right? So you might consider development mode and working on it, display those kinds of exceptions because that will help you debug if there's a problem. All right? However, 
when you're in production mode, maybe you phrase the exceptions yourself. And I will leave yourself in some wiggle room here. What are some of the reasons why we can't delete? Well, we know we can't delete if there's related rows, if there's faculty members for that division. We also know that we can't delete if database maintenance is going on. In other words, if someone was in design mode. Are there other issues? Yeah. Well, there's a whole bunch of other potential issues. The database could be corrupt. The database server could have crashed. A lot of different things. So I'm going to phrase it in such a way that gives the user idea, first of all, number one, to tell them what happened. And in this case, the row wasn't deleted. All right? So I'm going to tell them, look, you tried to delete this row, but the row wasn't deleted. So tell them what happened. Give them some sense of the cause of it, all right? And then give them sort of directions of how to fix this. Um, so a good error message for a user in this case might be something like this. Error. Division not deleted. What happened? All right. The division, there was an error and the division wasn't deleted. What are the possible causes of this? Probable causes. Faculty members exist related to that division or database maintenance is occurring if you have verified there are no faculty for this division and this error persists contact the DBA all right. Oh, that's a mouthful. You know, you can even have a table of error messages and retrieve the data from there. Although that's probably not a good idea, right? To have error messages about a database in a database, because if there's a problem with the database, how do you get the data from the database? Anyhow, this is a nice error message in that it satisfies sort of the three things that you want to include in the database in an error message, uh, like what happened. In this case, tell them that you thought you deleted something, but joke's on you, it wasn't deleted. Second thing is what the problem cause are. Third thing, how to fix it. So now if we go and delete this or try to delete something, we get that error message, which is pretty descriptive. Okay. Next time, what will we do? We will put code in to make sure you can't do any of this maintenance unless you're logged in. All right. We could even up the security and say that in addition to having a valid user ID, you have to be a site administrator. Maybe we'll do that. That might be fun. Then we'll do almost the same thing we did with the grid view with the details view. Uh, 
the details view is similar in a lot of respects to the grid view, but there are some differences in it. So most namely of the differences is that you can, um, you can um, uh, insert as well as update and delete. But a lot of the things I talked about, making template columns, using the undeleted event, and so on, those are all things that um, apply here too. We would, by the way, probably put the same code in the item updated event that we have here. We would word the error message differently because we're not talking about a deletion, we're talking about an update. But again, would put the similar code in the deleted event because we never know, uh, in the updated event because we don't know if there's database maintenance going on and the, and the update was, uh, uh, didn't go through. All right. So we'll pick up on this next time. Remember, your project design is due. Run it past me. Show it to a classmate. Share what you have. Um, and again, let's talk about it in lab if you have any questions. I'll go unlock the lab. Then I'll come back and grab the files. Then 